Hello and welcome to another Shark Special. You can't get enough of them. Jason certainly can't get enough of them. And he just keeps rounding people up. So this is brilliant. So today we are going to talk all about Sharks Eagles. So we have got a massive, massive treat for you. So Assumpter's back, first of all. Hey Assumpter, how are you doing? Hello, hello. How is hey. Spain locked down again or are you guys all right? Up uh, here, we are all right. <clears throat> We're in Barcelona, though. Uh, you know, the point is to be flexible. Whatever it happens is <laughs> happening. And so, mm, you know, we are cool. We are, you know, doing our, our streamings every day. So no matter where we are, we're happy. That's why the living room looks like a brothel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Ironically, I don't, Nolan's not coming, is he, Jason? No, he couldn't make it either. Nolan doesn't want to leave his man cave. Have you seen his man cave on social media? Yeah, it actually looks like the brothel um, that Assumpter and Scott are sitting in. <clears throat> it's got like motorbikes. No wonder yeah. he won't. We, we've got much more reasonable rates. That's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to put some colour to honour Gav. Uh, well, essentially, Nolan Hemmings will never leave his man cave again because it's awesome. There's like four motorbikes in there and everything. He's been putting pictures up on Facebook. But we do have Gavin O'Hurlihy, Captain Leroy, or Leroy if you're from London like me. Gavin, hey. Hey. <laughs> who is somewhere in Bath because you've been here 40 years, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it, uh, on an old plateau, an old, an old World War II era. Uh, so anyway, we're talking about eagles. Is that it now? It is. Is that what yeah. we're on? We also have with us Paul Bigley, whose job's cult hero. Hey! He's watched, uh, he's done his research twice. You've watched this back, haven't you? I've got it on in the background as well. I'm just watching, uh, uh, Sean and, and Dara and some sort of campfire scene. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all come back very quickly. Oh, God, yeah, 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 yeah. Blimey. Yeah, no, was, I, had a, I had a, I mean, it was, like, it was a nightmare. The first bit of it was a nightmare, wasn't it? But at the same time, it's so great, great fun being with everybody. It's just brilliant. It's really brilliant. Like you say, Gab, it was just, it's just so many memories now. Whenever you see anybody, it's just like, oh my God, we got through it. Well, I mean, Russia, 1992, the marriage below, and you can't not have them. I mean, walking those promenades into Yalta in the silence. Anyway, we did this extended bus trip, long bus trip. Uh, we got pulled over the road by some gangsters as well on the bus trip who checked us out, which is another yeah. aspect of it. But anyway, we took this bus trip and we, we, we drive through this poverty stricken, you know, kind of semi-Grecian land. Oh, way. We're driving, driving Grecian. for hours. And we're driving for hours. We finally arrive in a town called Simferiopol. And I here I am thinking, this is the grayest. There's nobody on the streets. There might be a pram walking. No noise. Gray. Yellow lanterns, you know, separated by, you know, 350 meters each. And I remember thinking, good God, you know, it's like the end of the world. The end of the world. This is a country that's obviously disintegrating. Anyway. Gray, just everything gray. We go into this gray hotel, up into these tiny little rooms with tiny little balconies, and I'm just looking out on this gray, dismal, dismal world. And suddenly, I sit down on my balcony, I put my foot up, I decide to smoke a little, what was it? Uh, it must be Crimean green. Anyway, Crimean green. Anyway, I'm sitting here, splitting this grayness, splitting this soullessness, splitting all of this what a wonderful world by Louis Armstrong. Beautiful. It was floating from above me. Somebody had the cool to set up in their room and put on this music and spread it out into the night. <laughs> That's the, that, I've never forgotten that moment. That was so magnificent. But so yeah, I, you know, you know, the place may have been devoid of color, but you injected so much color into that, that short time you were there, bro, bro believe me. Well, believe I me. think your shirt is catching up with me. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, these. It's I, disappointed that Gab's actually American. I was hoping he was like an Etonian who was just... <laughs> Gab's American? Got on a Malak, his accent. Yeah. <laughs> I'm American now. God, I've been here now 40 years. Oh, yeah. 40 Plus, years. He was he... hoping you were like an English public schoolboy who just put the accent... No, 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 no. That was no effect. They're, they're probably... God, I went to a wedding once... Uh, of a bunch of English public school boys, and boy, uh, I didn't slot there. That was a, <laughs> about a happy couple of hours. I was, who are these assholes? Jesus Christ, what are they? Well, what everybody doesn't know is that actually Sean Bean is did go to Eton, and it's all just been a, a, a terrible, <laughs> terrible <laughs> fake that he's been pulling pulling the wool over everybody's eyes. Uh, There's a reason why more, he dies in every what, film. What's yeah. more, he went to RADA too. 
he he did. Yeah, he did. definitely a posh bloke. Yeah. When I was watching yesterday, I was watching the scene at Dimaji where where um, a Sunta comes out and surprises us all. And do you remember you, me, and Paul Trussell used to go and make fires in in the sort of boulder underneath the boulders yeah, up up the mountain. Do you remember that? Remember that, pops? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember you guys didn't know how to build a fire, but I mean, yeah, I remember it well. I mean, uh, you know, we needed what heat. Said, what happened was I had the fire going nicely, and then Gav arrived and just went, "Hey, that's not a fire." Well, this <laughs> when I felled like three trees and created a sort of Chernobyl type uh, explosion of well, fire. That is of well, course got, lovely, Paul Russell. Here. Hello, hey Paul, have, how are you doing? Have, I'm all right, Alexandra. How are you? I'm not bad, not bad. So one of the chosen men is here. Marcus is in with us today. Marcus from Apsley House. Hey, Marcus. Hey, everyone. How you doing? Marcus is having a surreal moment because his girlfriend is downstairs watching Midsummer Murders. And here in the chat, we have the lovely Neil Dudgeon. Hey. hey. Where's Neil? Where's Neil? Yeah, I'm up here. <laughs> I've got well, it on this gallery view. It's like it's like celebrity squares without the celebrities, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> The Anybody most exciting addition for Marcus to this today is the lovely Michael Cochran. Oh, there was some epic bastardry going on in Sharp's Eagle, but surely, surely none of it tops Simerson. Hello, Michael. Hello, and hello, hello. to you, all of you. Hello, hello Poggy. <laughs> I can't stop laughing. <laughs> just you wait, mate. He has gone bright, bright red. It shows he's a good actor because I thought he was just so grumpy for his whole, whole career. So it's nice to see him smile. <laughs> Marcus, it. get it out of the way. Ask him to do it at the beginning. And then yeah, we'll... Michael, could you could you please give us some uh, some horse guards, please? Yes. I've got a cousin at horse I've guards. I've got a cousin at horse guards. I've got a cousin at horse guards. <laughs> 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 on those lines. Gav, hello. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey. You were more Russian than the Russians. That's one of my abiding memories as well. You know, what the Russians that? would sit down. Well, you were, I mean, the Russians would sit around those kind of those big kind of and boom, the first toast in 20 seconds, bang, gone. The next toast is 20 seconds later, bang, gone. Ten minutes later, the room's 5,000 miles an hour, 50 feet high, and you were the one, you were the, whenever we were hanging, you knew how to stay with these guys, and they, they loved you for it, because you would go in there and say, hey, I can stay with these boys, and you could, but my God, the way they no, drank when they, when they did the, uh, and that's the, and one of my great memories. Guys, though, they? Uh, you, you know, but you joined it, I mean, you were good at it, you know, you were, uh, you were the only one I could see who could actually stay with them. So uh, that's that's a, that's another big memory. That's, Here's that's enjoying an afternoon on the balcony. God, where was that? That's, that's the Rossia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in the hiatus between Force Majeure being called and us leaving on that incredible plane and uh, bus trip, which we we'll must but get they into. Were, they were putting the five gallon things of fuel into the wing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we and we were baking our cakes before we left. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes uh, boy. It, it went, and the uh, no, no. What was it on the bus trip? Uh, the uh, breath holding contest in the back. Do you remember that? that? No. No, but yeah, there was a, a whole. I, that's one of my memories as well. I was sitting in the back of that thing with you and probably half a dozen others, seeing who could hold their breath the longest with a little help. Uh, yeah, I've got gotcha. you. Gotcha. Thank God somebody invented the iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, is this what people did before they had social media and stuff? Yeah. Well, on, this on this particular bus trip, Alex, yes, we were coming home. We thought the show was over. Uh, Paul McGann had gone out before us. All the exec producers, the director, the associate producer, all had left on the plane, leaving us alone. So we, we get on our plane about five hours late. And when we touch down in Moscow, we get on a bus to go to the Novotel. It's about three in the morning. And we uh, suddenly we're trundling on. We get pulled over. And some dude with a leather yeah, jacket and, a, yeah, and yeah. a cab gets on. And we think, what the fuck's this about? And uh, anyway, he gets off after a while. And we find out it's a racketeer trying to shake down the bus. But was told, look, this is a busload of foreigners. You better not, you better not mate. Well, I sat, I sat at the front seat. Oh, great. Tell and us. He came on, and I, took, I looked over to Irina, who looked frightened. 
And there were three others in the car. It was a car, a small car with four people in it. And these two got out. This guy got in. The other one waited at the door. But he looked down at the back of the at the back, of, and all he saw were these kind of northern Englishmen and a few others tagged in. And he thought you could see his mind working. He was kind of thinking, "Is it worth it? Do I try to shake down this group of people, or do I just say, fuck it, go on and let's let's, let's move and go to the next bus or the next car or whatever they did?" And he decided, looking down at that group of uh, Brits, I suppose, with a few Spaniards thrown in and a Yank at the front, he decided not to do it. But it was a, it was a good 90 seconds where yeah. he had to think what he was going to do. A minute, minute and a half, two minutes, and the driver was nervous sitting in the front because he pulled over, obviously. So, yeah, that was uh, – that was he was armed. I mean, this was uh, this was serious. And and that was on the 23rd of September, 1992, because I got my little file effects here. So that was that was almost 27 years, uh, eight years ago, today. But, we, we, but haven't we been briefed that people have been murdered on that route from one airport to the next and that we should look out for these people? <laughs> and then suddenly this Trabant, this tiny car, starts to ram the coach over to the side. Yeah. And the girl, I remember at the front, Gab, that the girl, I was sitting right next to you. Irene, girl, yeah. She was so scared. She, she went white as a sheep because she knew that they were black market racketeers and that people had been murdered on that Gangster. same route. They were, they were local gangsters, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think possibly she mentioned that the people above them might not look, you know, happily on the fact that they take their trade. So, um, you know, blimey. Yeah. It was a scary moment because I could see that he was packing something in his chest as well. Yeah. You know, and those of us at the front will worry, and you guys at the back will going. <laughs> <laughs> and were the morning muskets and... on board as well? But, you know, they well, probably looked, they took one look at Dara and thought, "Oh no, oh no." <laughs> oh no, you know, the, I still remember in Lisbon. I mean, I remember uh, I think Carcass and I left the restaurant. Yes, and yes. we took off. And you guys, they they were saying we want like they did in Prague. We want we want three grand. I mean, that was another job. But they we want we want three thousand for a meal that costs all fifteen of you three hundred. And they brought in some of the local heavies. But they didn't realize that this is what you guys, the, you Northern Englishmen, do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> they were completely discombobulated. I mean, you know, suddenly they burst out the door and went after these guys. And they all ended up, you know, taken off because, you know, you guys know how to do that shit. I mean, you do it for fun. So, uh. The full, you know. the full story, Gav, is in my book, but I'll quickly, I'll pre appreciate it for you. Okay. So they overcharged us by several hundred escudos because back then it was Lisbon. And, uh, we had Sano with us. So she was Portuguese speaking. She could tell that they had cooked the books. So after a while, and us plunking down as much money as we could, we got a bit ball of it and we noticed someone had been sent to the we were in a basement they'd been sent to the top of the stairs which went out into the alley in the al Fama district to stop us getting out and i had been arguing with my girlfriend at the time all night so i was waiting to kill someone just ready to just murder you always were i mean that's yeah a, yeah well yeah i mean remember you and asunta saved me one still. <laughs> but but let's go back to the England. so i ran up the stairs yanked the guy out of the way, opened the door, and there was a dude there with a knife. Oh. Before I could, I knew what was going on, I had been shoved into the gutter, and Bino had come charging, Rah! and the geezer fled like Usain Bolt up the alley. And that was the end of that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. Well, this is a deleted scene from Sharp or real life. Well, it's in my book. I shouldn't go anyway. So the next person out was Bernard Cornwall. And he was grinning from ear to ear, thinking, my creation isn't come to life in front of me. It was beautiful. <laughs> Daniel Craig says hi, but he can't make it. Uh... And Lyndon says, where's my six quid, you bastard, for my alarm clock? L Lyndon should be here. Yeah, I was going to say, if Lyndon comes on, we could do a sort of mock trial of Daniel Craig uh, for, and you, you Eagle Cast can protect, uh, defend him. He, he took on a load and he did it well, I thought. For, the, no, for those that didn't know, uh, Daniel Craig lobbed Lyndon's alarm clock off a balcony because it was <laughs> shut up. So Lyndon says he owes him a fiver plus interest, so six quid will cover it. I don't think Daniel can afford that these days, can he? He's doing part time in Argos, so maybe you can get a deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh, he, do you know he what? Is... I watched it last night and I forgot what an utter bastard he was in that. Absolutely. Oh. There's He's some great, him. great bastardry in that episode. I loved it. 
First of all, though, on this, Paul, you were saying beforehand that, so all of you guys obviously um, film with Paul McGann as well, um, those of you that haven't been with us before. So you were all sent home, weren't you? Uh, yes, we were sent home because we filmed, uh, obviously a lot of been filmed. When I turned up, uh, we got to Moscow first and then we travelled down to Simferopol and then we start, I started filming. And uh, my first day, when I first met Paul, I think, he was on the floor in one of the tents uh, with his leg all bandaged up, and I sort of walked into this room. Oh shit! You know, we're doing an action movie, and here's the sort of leading guy on the floor, and then all the stories started flying about what was what had gone on, and you know, oh my god, you know, what's going to happen here? Um, but Paul was, uh, you know, he was still doing all his stuff, and they were putting him through all this stuff, you know, going up in hills and down dales and blah blah blah. And I had my little Super 8 camera with me, and um, I think he used that in the end in a court case that he brought against it because. You know, it, it was supposedly the producers that made this football uh, game and and uh, he got involved in it and then he did his leg in and they were trying to sue him or whatever, I can't remember. But, um, yeah, it was it was quite a sort of weird thing to turn up to, you know, and then and then it all sort of started to break down, as I remember it. Uh, the food started to go to pot, everything, and there was a great big meeting um, and, we, and I think um, uh, Lennox... Um, made this speech about, uh, you know, an army marches on its stomach and we are on our knees. And and then uh, it all disbanded and we all came home. I didn't know about the politics at the time, what was going on behind the scenes. But um, And then suddenly, like I said, you know, we were suddenly, I thought that was the end of it. And then suddenly we were given a call about a week later saying, you know, pack your bags because you're all going back. And you've got a new man, a leading man, and you've got a new director. And it was like, well, Jesus, what happened? <laughs> but we yes. shot a lot of the the same scenes. I think we shot. No, no. I remember, you know, yes. there's one scene we shot three times. Uh, the one with the apples, where Neil sticks his, yes. uh, his sword in the apples, and we were in the same place with the same horses and the same setup three times. I think once with Paul and twice with Sean. Uh, and uh, I just did this like Groundhog Day, you know. <laughs> and because of budgetary constraints, also the same apples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but it's called the Torringe scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they were going to use tomatoes or oranges. They weren't sure. And in the, in the Meganeo, they used watermelons. And it was... At, do you remember this, Neil? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm looking at this in bewilderment. Thinking, Look at all those fine young men in their lovely uniforms. I don't remember... I don't remember apples and oranges. Do you, do you remember the scene where you're, you're surprised by Assumpta's agents and you un, unveil rifles in a, in a cart that are covered with apples? No. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, and you say, is this, is this Nada 2? Is this Nada 2? And you whip open this blanket and there's rifles. I haven't, I must say, I don't think I've seen the episode in 30 odd years. So I'm struggling. It's called the Torrange scene, but none of the fruits or vegetables works. In the end, they had to use apples. But uh, yeah, I remember three times we shot that. Crazy. Neil would have struggled to get his sword through a watermelon lift. Up. Exactly, that yeah. Quite yeah. A physical... It would one actually did and it just bent the sword so it was, it was crazy <laughs> and there's another there's another scene that um, they actually do use bits of the Paul McGann era and that's when we charge across the bridge the Val de la Casa bridge uh, to to you know meet the, the French scouts and when they show the French cavalry hidden in the woods behind the ridge you can see it's really hot summer you can see it's hazy summer when they cut back to where we're shooting it in October, the light's a bit different. So those shots are from the McGann era, the shots of the cavalry on their own in the woods, waiting to come out and slaughter Lennox and take the colour. Can I, can I just say, um, do you remember that? I was just watching again last night, and uh, I remember that, you remember Nolan, uh, and, and it's still in the film, and if you, yeah. if you look carefully, uh, with the first lot that we shot with Jim Goddard, uh, he had a straight sword, and there was that day, uh, when uh, Jim had said, he got up on his high horse and he said, what's bloody Nolan got a straight sword for? Give him a bloody cavalry sword. Let's have a look at it. And he, and he said, put Nolan in. And of course, Nolan had never rehearsed with a cavalry sword, which is bent and it's got a sort of six inch deflection. And it's at that point when all those horses were coming down, like 10 tons of horses, the French cavalry coming in, and we're trying to defend ourselves, that Nolan was in this fight with the stunt guy and because he'd been switched, the swords were switched at the last minute, no one never trained with it, he actually went into the guy, do you remember, and he actually stabbed him? Yes. And the look on Nolan's face is the one that they use in the cut there, which is from the original version. And Nolan's face is like, he has just stabbed somebody, yeah. and he realises he's just stabbed somebody. It's like, what the 
you know. Uh, and I remember thinking, I remember thinking, standing there with a the little, tiny little musket going, there's like 10 tons of horses coming down. And I was, what are we going to do? Did he, um, did, he, did he make a sound when he was stabbed? No, he, no, the look on his no. face is one of sheer horror. Oh, oh the, the, the stunt guy, I think he just took it like a man. He was a Russian well, stunt guy. The Russians were uniquely, I found. I mean, there was a morning in uh, in, in Yalta, I think, in some place, in one of the big buildings, where uh, I think Cochran, Michael, Cochran, Michael, and I were, in, and a few others were changing early morning. And I had noticed that the Russians dealt with pain in a way that I had never seen before. Whenever they got kicked by a horse or they got hurt, nobody made any noise, nobody made any sound. And this one guy climbed onto one of these massive, uh, you know, leaded windows, and I mean, massive sash windows. Uh, eight foot high, whatever. I think this is where Stalin stayed when he was in, in the Yalta conference. And the window came down on his hand. Now, I'd, I had broken my arm like four days earlier, five days earlier, just a, not a bad break, but I just knocked off a horse. And I got up there, and I tried to lift the window off on the sill. I, I got up on the sill. I tried to lift the window off this guy's hand early morning, and I couldn't. By a, a skew, I, I had to straddle him to get it. I got the window off his hand. Now it had peeled the flesh on his fingers from the top knuckles all the way down, maybe down almost to the first knuckle. Literally, yeah. just the flesh, and it didn't bleed a lot. That, that's what was curious because there wasn't a lot of blood banging around in your fingers. But I remember it bled obviously. But anyway, he never made a sound. What he did was I got it off him, and he just jumped off the sill and walked out of the room in total silence. And I remember thinking, Jesus Christ. And I stopped one of the, uh, I think maybe I read it again, and I said, what's going on? I said, I've seen guys kicked, I've seen guys really hurt, and no one's made a sound. And she said, what people don't realize, she said, we're Mongols, it's part of our culture. When you're a child and you get hurt, you're taught to not cry. You're taught to, with, with, to restrain any kind of, noise or, you know, emotional pain, it's not thought to be a good thing. So from a very young age, you're taught that you deal with pain, you deal with it. You confront it, you don't cry, you keep it at bay. And those are the guys the Germans had to fight <laughs> while they say, while they say. Anyway, I remember that and thinking, Jesus, you know, that it's it's a cultural thing. They, they really sound like modern-day millennials, actually. Um. <laughs> Isn't that a Scientology thing where Tom Cruise expected Katie Holmes to give birth without making a noise? Oh, they're just, I hate guys. I remember the Scientology when they started. <laughs> they were nuts at the start. I mean, in California, LA, Malibu, Santa Monica, 1960s and 70s. Oh, man. They were crazy. Michael, Hello. we have so many questions come in for you. Uh, most of them revolving around what an awesome git you were in this in shop and how everybody absolutely loves. Uh, what you brought to the role of Simerson. And Paul Herdman says, when you were first offered the part of Simerson, had you read the books in that? Because for a lot of the people that were sending us questions, they think that you've got his part so perfectly right. They want to know um, how much of the books you used to do that. Or is it just, was it just something you individually brought to the script when you read it? Well, I can't remember now, but I, I basically read the script and thought, well, this looks a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and it's not often you can behave as badly as he did. So it was a most enjoyable bit of the job, quite apart from everybody else who was in it. Because here we are, a quarter of a century later, discussing something in which we all uh, participated. And every single person on that film set was just extraordinarily wonderful. <laughs> he had a crazy character. It was the friendships, really, that did it. And, and Gav mentioned the Russians. Well, Slava and I, who was the, one of the main stunt people, got on terribly well. He looked after me when all the bangs and horses. I was not, never very good at horses. And, um, you know, people would dig holes next to where you were sitting on the horse and then plant things in it. And Tom Clegg would say, well, there's just a bit of smoke will go up, don't you worry. And I remember they cut the reins, um, uh, and I had to leap off the horse, frightened as I always was, the cowardly person, and leap into a ditch with Sean and uh, the chosen men. Anyway, this thing went off like Hiroshima. 
an extraordinary expression. The horse rose in the air and turned 180 degrees in the air, and then off it went. And I was left hanging on to its mane, uh, showered with all sorts of debris. I thought I was going to die. And I was a speech, <laughs> rather girlishly, I seem to remember. Nobody took the slightest fucking interest in it at all. That was, I was out of the shop. Everybody was onto something. And by the time I came back, like half an hour later, on this bloody horse, nobody thought anything of it at all. This was just part and parcel of the day's filming. And you just got on with it. Uh, yeah. Drew, Drew Bale also asks, um, and I think you've kind of answered it already. They want to know, because you were so good at being a nasty piece of work. Were people nice to you when the cameras were off or did they just not want to know you? Uh, no, everybody was nice all the time. I mean, Sean was a utter sweetheart, really, and, you know, sort of shrieking and doing all that sort of battle acting. Which we should I answer that, really. Uh, other people should answer whether they could deal with cocky offset. <laughs> yes, we could. Ah. We the, oh, bless you. So much fun and so much of a, uh, uh opposite from what was going on, the turmoil, the depression, the starvation, the pissed off with the producers cocky was always there to make you smile and and the eagle cast were there when it was at the worst so you know you know the, okay. the remaining years were okay-ish but that time on the first year they saw the worst of everything so in many ways they they're chosen men as well but all but, of the cast but cocky is cock, cock, michael was yeah. talking to the russians as he was to all of us i mean he was he he if you wanted a party michael was certainly not in this debate. So, I mean, there's a there's a memory of somebody who was knocking on the door. We used to sit in Michael's room for hours in the evenings, four or five of us, and uh, he was he was getting into it. He was getting into the whole Russian thing, and there was a knock at the door, and it was one of the editor's assistants. I, I, remind me if this is true or not. I, I mean, it's my memory that somebody showed up in his room, knocked on the door, walked in, and said, "Michael, I need to talk to you." And I think Dan was in there. And I think Neil was in there. I think there were a few of us in there. And Michael said, all right, go ahead. My friends are here. And uh, they said, well, you know, I think I'd rather do this privately. And, of course, Michael blew through that in an instant, right? So this person finally kind of nervously says, well, th there might be a problem uh, in, in some of the rushes. And what is that, says Michael? Well, You've aged. <laughs> <laughs> You've aged 20 years <laughs> in three months. <laughs> I, the laughter, I tell you, we laughed for hours. <laughs> because, because he had. <laughs> it, it, from, from March to whatever it was. He was <laughs> just going full speed, digging every minute of it. Like, full speed, full speed. Joining the Russians. It was just amazing. But it was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard in my life. And I still laugh when I think of it now. <laughs> uh, That's brilliant. Um, also, as well, we had another question. Uh, David Brown, I love the way he's worded it. He says, how did you, um, oh, no, he says, are you surprised to have lasted so long on the series without meeting a violent end? Outlives everyone, that bugger. Yeah, I was. Very <laughs> surprised. I thought I was in and out, to be perfectly honest. Um, I thought one look at one of the rushes, I thought, well, that's me out of this. Pretty damn smartish. But uh, no, I, I was, I remember Tom Clegg ringing me up in the last one in India saying, we're going to be doing Sharps, whatever it was, Peril or something. And um, he says, and you're in it. And the surprise in his voice made me very surprised to hear it as well, you know. I, but he was a great character. And unfortunately, we lost, you know, dear old Pete Postlethwaite, who was also a wonderful, wonderful villain. And uh, I was just very lucky. Um, it was one of the best you... jobs I've ever had because of the people, because of... the you know, the character and all the rest of it. How many and episodes did you do, Cocky? About seven, I think. Seven? <laughs> you, did, you, did Eagle, you did Eagle, you did Sword, you did Regiment. Yeah. And Peril, right? So it's five, I think, or four. And Challenge. You didn't do Challenge, did you? I, I honestly don't remember now. I did two in India. And yeah, I so yes, you did Challenge, yeah. So you did challenge, yeah. So, yeah, seven, seven, yeah. 
Can I ask though, Michael, didn't you end up being staked down to the ground naked? Was that you? That was deeply embarrassing, Dave. <laughs> um, and the Not in the, the script, th- obviously. It's <laughs> 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 a Friday night. <laughs> no chance to get a chubby going. Oh, one, one of the questions was, what did you do in your time off? So tell us, Cocky, what did you do? Uh, well, what did I do? Well, I drank a great deal. I remember that. Um, smoked quite a lot um, and laughed even more, I think. <laughs> that was it, really. It was drinking, smoking and laughing. <laughs> and that was just a script. <laughs> well, at the end of, at the, end of the, the nude scene, having been staked out in immense heat and in front of everybody, and at the end of which, Sean gave me a very small pebble. It was almost pea shingle. And said, that's what your cock reminded me of. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got it somewhere with a little little tiny bit of, uh, you know, SB on the bottom. I hope you're talking about the pebble. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Michael, did you like the fact that you got to turn it around in the end? What do you mean? In, 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 sort of turning up bonkers. Your, and... your relationship was sharp. Yeah. Yes, well, it was fairly extraordinary. You know, suddenly I loved this man and felt very sorry. Which I did, because I, the last scene or two were sort of quite moving, because I'd been in the thing such a long time, over a long period. And um, there I was, sort of in love with Sharp, which seemed extraordinary and uh, not really terribly truthful, but we just got on with it. And uh, it was surprisingly moving. Mm. It was touching, but it was a bit of a shift, wasn't it? Because first of all, you're bonkers, and like... Well, this is the Lord, Lord Chitu, and then saying, Richard yes. Sharp. We yes. handled it really well, but the script, I thought, let you down a little bit. Well, it was, yes, it was a, a slightly absurd moment, but then we had lots of absurd moments one way and another. And the last question that we had um, come in for you, it was, uh, they want to know, obviously everyone hates your character. Is that like a point of honour for you, that you played it that well, that everyone can't stand Simerson? Well, it's very nice of you to say so. I just, I just played the chap, really. I mean, I, I, I went, I went to a public school, and there were blokes like that in the school I was at, and I just sort of thought of one or two of the prefects who beat the bejesus out of me, and thought, well, this is them, you know. So it was quite an easy transition from who I am really to playing that son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating in the slightest when I tell you that Marcus quotes you to us in our group chat probably three or four times a week. Oh, God. Yes, something about <laughs> Normally misquotes, but yes, it's uh, yes, quite right. But... I do watch that scene too much, so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Neil. Um, we hear a lot about how horrible it was. Uh, This has become like, every time we do this, it gets more horrific, the stories of the Ukraine um, in the first series and how terrible it was. Is there a moment when they called you all back up and said, oh, we're back on and we've got a new leading man where you all just thought, oh, shit. (laughs) Uh, My memory of it is that we shot about five weeks with Paul, would it be? And then I remember Dr. Gaynor came out by train, I seem to recall, because he'd seen, I think Paul had seen various a couple of Russian doctors who'd said, no, no, it's fine, and wear the leg brace and stuff, and then Gaynor came out three days on a train and came and said, it's fine, he's fine, and, you know, you carry on, and went away again, and then Paul decided he needed to come back to London to have his own person look at it. And then, as you were saying, everybody kind of disappeared and left us, and we didn't know what was going to happen, and then we we had the great return to uh, to England where we had a meeting with equity. Um, them saying, we've never, I've been here 20 years, and I've never heard a list of things like this about the, oh, you know, the just any old random uh, horses from local farms they'd got, not film horses who were untrained. So every time, uh, I remember you reminded me, Cocky said about your horse charging off. There was one scene, I recall, I was sit, sitting, being very bad on a horse, sitting on the horse, and uh I knew they were going to let off a big maroon right behind me and a big drum, a big explosion. 
And as I sat there waiting for the action, they said, you know, they're doing the clapper right in front of my horse, who was just kind of looking a bit <laughs> unhappy about it all and didn't know why he was there. And they did the little clap on the clapper board, and the horse went. And I thought, oh, shit, he's, kind of, he's kicking off about this tiny little click, and they're about to blow up this. <laughs> I was I was on the point of saying, could I just ask if, and then this, you know, action, and the thing went off, and this this horse just shot off across, like you're describing. I think we've got probably all had experience like this, standing up in the stirrups, clinging onto his mane, shouting as he was sort of just charging across that sort of rocky terrain towards some sort of cliff edge. It was like a cartoon, and I was thinking, like, you know, so should I? Should I throw myself off, or I'm just going to die always, with the horse? Always a bad idea. Huh? Always a bad idea. Bad idea to jump off a racing horse. That's yeah, no, idea. yeah, I did, I did, once. Oh, God. And, uh, to this day, sleeping on my left side is a little tender. Oh, God, darling, you must be careful. Yeah, yeah, no shit. You can't time it. You can't time it. It's impossible. I yeah, I wouldn't want to try and do that, no. Um, so I think that when they came back and said, all right, the, the, they've agreed to all the various stipulations from uh, equity and the insurers and stuff like that going back. Um, I don't, Well, there wasn't any choice about going back. You kind of had to go back and complete your contract. Okay, I, re yeah. I recall that I was booked for five weeks yeah. and I ended up being there for about five and a half months. And when we, I, we were originally booked for 16 weeks and we spent 22 weeks. Yeah. Continuously. Well, I think you, got, you, you yeah, to go yeah, home, you know. Uh, because what, what I recall about when we went back was that most of my stuff uh, had been, most of the stuff that my character had to do, I think, was not with the Sharp character. So they'd shot all my stuff, and they only had me back to reshoot the stuff that I'd shot with Paul, which wasn't very much. But because the schedule was all over the place, they they couldn't let me go home and bring me back because they didn't know what was going to happen. So they said you'd have to stay. So I, I recall doing about half a half a day a week, and the rest of the time I was smoking and drinking with Cocky, and I was going out shopping to the local market, because you'd all bought your own cookers, because the food was all, you know, the, the food was terrible, and, uh, um, but that we could go to the, uh, we could go into, uh, into the town, to the market, and buy fresh produce and various stuff. And I used to be sent off to, by Gavin usually, would give me a shopping list in the morning, um, and send me off to the market to come back with his food. And I remember one of my proudest moments as an actor in a long and tedious career was Gavin saying to me, the thing that I'd really like more than anything is um, is a garlic press, if you could find a garlic press. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is my day's mission. And I went off into the market and I came back with a garlic press for Gavin. And I, I was very thrilled to be able to satisfy your desire for crushed garlic. Neil, that was probably the highlight of the job and, and indeed my career, I should think. Neil, did you, did you also buy uh, an illuminated gondola at some point? Yes, I, I did. I, had I that. did as well. Yeah. Didn't we all buy? We all bought all those things. There was that, there was that, Bloke, on the front, on the promenade, there was the guy yeah. who had the little shop where you could buy all those sorts of things. And we, we just gave him, I think I just gave him all my per diems, really. And to the extent, I think he eventually invited, was it me and you, Michael, or something, or just me? Or something? He invited me to his house, which I think by that stage I was thinking, I'm really spending far too much money with you if you're in, actually inviting me back to your house. But they were charming and lovely, and I've got tons of all the stuff that we've all got, the badges and the hats and gondolas, all that. We got them engraved. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We got them engraved, right? Yep. Sharp 92 there. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Got to my one, I wonder. Oh. Uh, I'll send you one. Uh. <laughs> I remember going to get it done in that place where the fountains were in front of. Remember, remember going that's to that? Oh, and what about this? i still got this. I don't Whoa. know. Oh. It's, it's, it's perfume. Okay. It's perfume? In a tin. Yeah. I think we should open it right now and sniff it so we can see what happens. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure it might be petrol or something that'll be hilarious. Well, I haven't I opened know. it since '92, so I'm not going to open it now. I'm, I kind of like. You know, <laughs> I have to say, Paul, you have the quote of the entire episode. Not tonight, Jezebel. Oh, not tonight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lovely girl. 
I prefer Paul's quote where he says, woe unto those who rise up and drink strong drink all day or something, that one. Yeah. I, just, I like the way he periodically wanders onto screen and just comes out with something like that and wanders off again. It's brilliant. Wandering is something I'm I'm known for in the business. I do you know what I I have a question for Assumpter actually because I was watching it again this morning um, and I watched some of it last night. Did you ever look at all the other women in it with their lovely pretty dresses and think I'm I think you're going to say no, but did you ever think I oh, just want to be pretty just once? Well, I wear makeup and a low cut dress. Well, I, I I don't know. It was not my role, really. Yeah. <laughs> I love being with pistols and yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, it's brilliant. I just I was thinking about it and I was thinking, no, she had the best female role in the entire thing. Yeah, I love, I love it. I mean, I really loved it. And um, you know, that was also my first role ever. You know, when I was thirteen, was being disguised as a man. So for me, it was a little bit of a, of you know, going to the roots kind of thing. And and I don't know. I always like more to mingle around men and women, really. Yeah, <laughs> but um, it but like you yeah. had so much fun. Yeah, I was like, uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, had also very great companionship with Sano, who the first year was the makeup artist and we were cooking for a lot of people. I don't know if you remember, but, you know, I had like a suitcases full of pasta and, and, and rice. And and so, yeah, I was all, also going to the market and doing all these women things for the men, for my men. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to line but, Michael's stomach for him in preparation for drinking with the Russians. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I always, you know, I always wish that, you know, I always I was discussing with the director about, you know, trying to, to have more action scenes for her and less lovey loving stuff. <laughs> but uh, but uh, sometimes I, you know, oh, that's nice. That's you know, this is one of the lunches. In fact, I was, I was actually saying, Gavin was the first person to buy a cooker on Sharp and uh, he, and Sano inherited it. And then I inherited it the next year, but we, Sano would make incredible lunches. Stanley. Yes, Sano with me. Yes, we had yes, the cooker. Yes. Yes. It was very hard actually to cook nice things because every, yeah. you know, like like it was like just one, you know, I don't know, one apple. One uh, there was only there was very few things in the market. It was very and they were very expensive sometimes. Uh, the things, the vegetables, was nothing. It was always hard to find uh, stuff. But, um, yeah, I never got ill. I always was drinking from the tap water. I, you know, I was not really, you know, taken by, by any of these uh, illnesses. But, um, yeah, it was like, uh, I, um, it was like my home, really. It was nice. And uh, speak, go on. Speaking of illness, uh, I still have a memory of David Troughton. In the hallway outside my room, mm-hmm. uh, shouting at uh, some medics because the illnesses were so it was so extreme. People got really ill, and most everybody lost a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wouldn't let them touch her with a needle. Mm-hmm. And he took out he took out his boots medical kit that he brought with him. And he brought out uh, a needle from the boots medical kit and said, "You use this." Did not touch him with that. He was so frightened of uh, of the Russian needles, and his wife was very ill. She was on the she was on the floor. She was being carried, and uh, but he was he was adamant. He was not going to let them go anywhere near with that needle. That's my memory of, of David on the hallway. Yeah. Gavin, can I ask a ask a question? So oh. there's there's one program that's like bigger in Napoleonics or film, I should say, in uh, Napoleonics than Sharp, and it's it's not Hobbler. Uh, it's Waterloo, uh, 1970 film. Yeah. And obviously, your father was a huge part in that as uh, Marshal Ney, and yeah, was, uh, we got yeah. a question from uh, Kevin Fright asking uh, what that was like uh, growing up, and did it have an influence on uh, Major Leroy? Uh, no. Uh, I was, they were actually, I was graduating from uh, a school in Massachusetts when they were shooting that in Russia. And uh, so I was kind of on my own, and I ended up in Southern California in a van, uh, having the summer of 42 tied together with the year that the moon landing and the uh, and Manson, all within a week of each other. So, no, no, I was, 
No, he, uh, they shot that. I saw it actually with him in Dublin a couple of years later when they'd finished it. And he was not a fan of Steiger. And Steiger was rather, uh, expressive in Waterloo. And, uh, and I just saw it some of the day and it was good. Every moment was clean. It was full of things. But, uh, not really. My two younger brothers were, 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 the drum boys, you know, but they were gone. He was, they were in Russia for God in Uzgorod of all places during the moon landing, which was an interesting aspect of moon landing because the Russians were told under all kinds of threats, uh, not to watch the moon landing. And uh, Hawkins, I think, and Steiger and my dad and a few others demanded, otherwise they were going to walk off the set. They demanded a television and the ability to watch it. So there they were in a place that kind of like where we were in, in some ferry pool, uh, watching on the television, and suddenly there was someone behind them in the hallway, and it was a Russian, one of the Russian makeup people. And he, and he kind of whispered into the room, do you mind, do you mind? And they all turned around and said no. And before the landing, there were 40 to 50 Russians in the wow. hall, in the rooms, crushed in there. Everyone wanted to see this. And they knew that they were they were doing it under you know serious threats back then. You didn't mess with the Russian authority, and they did just in order to see that landing. And my mother said years later it was one of the more emotional moments of her life to see the need they had to be part of this. But anyway, that's that digression, I suppose. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm that, a massive space nerd, so thank you, though, for that. That's amazing. Yeah, that reminds me of the time in '92 when you came to Yalta and you hired a room at the Yalta Hotel to watch the election results, the 92 election results come in. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And yeah. you watch CNN all night to see Clinton win, I guess. Was it 92? Yeah, 92. 92, yeah, he did. He won. He won the next two, two didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He but, but that's that. how dedicated, what's a dedicated Yank yeah. you, your family are? And the, the, uh, the, I remember, the, 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 another memory of that hotel was you could get Toblerone. Ah, oh, yes, I remember yeah. that. And I remember that when you got sick, and I got it eventually, and everyone got it. Uh, and when you got sick, you lost the stone in a hurry. And if you took Toblerone when you were recovering, if you were, say, two or three days into the recovery, or four days, or even five days, whatever, it would take a week to recover from this this, this bug. If you touched the Toblerone to your, to your tongue, you were instantly sick again. <laughs> The Toblerone would immediately kick it back in. And I remember that. Toblerone was a, was a no, no, you know, it's a wonderful chocolate, but chocolate was not good with the Russian bug. So uh, now I'm just thinking, hang on, Toblerone makes you lose a stone. In no, order. no, Toblerone makes you I'm all there. I'm going to, if I have the bug, I'll lose weight. <laughs> lost the weight with the bug. And then as you recovered, if you got three or four days into the recovery, if you took a Toblerone then, a piece of Toblerone, you would be sick again yeah. within, within minutes. That's my memory of it anyway. But, and I was really hoping you touched upon a secret weight loss where all you had to do was eat chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get Jardia Lambia, Alex. Just get yeah. that and you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be fine. Believe me. Not. I think, I rec- is this right? I recall that when we were first out there and everybody was terribly ill, that the, it, it was it was August, I think, when we started. So it was, it was really, really hot. Yeah, really yep. In the rocky, mountainy sort of thing. And there was a, the water that we had was the company supplied a, a, like a tanker full of water, like an oil tanker. The army. Full of the water. army. Yeah. yeah. And everybody got ill. Ill, out throwing up and having terrible shits and stuff. And I John never drank of the, out of this water. I never trusted. I prefer. This is brilliant. Well, Assumpta just drank out the tap, ate the food, and she never got sick. Never. I I drank out the water Bowser, which was a. Anyway, Neil, go on. That was that's interesting. What are you saying? I, 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 my memory is that John Tams had been particularly badly stricken. He was an early adopter and was particularly badly stricken. He was a very skinny man anyway and was wasting away. But he got some water from the Bowser to take back to when he came back. He took it back and went to his doctor, who said, "Oh yes, you've been terribly ill." And he said, "I've got this water here. I think maybe this might have something to do with it. Can it be tested?" And the guy went off and he tested and tested. And when John went back to see him, he said, "Oh, that water you gave me—that's just that's terrible." There he is, look, lovely man. Um, he said, "Oh, this is this is terrible. I hope you're washing in this. It's it's full of awful, terrible things." 
Um, and it, this was the water. And he was the, the doctor was kind of saying, "Oh my God, this is dangerous!" If you were washing in it, and we were kind of in the heat of those costumes, and in August in the uh, in that area, well, I, my memory of it at that stage was kind of chugging down, you know, cup after cup after cup of this water that was riddled with this parasitic. It's a parasitic amoeba or something, or some yeah, sort of parasite. Giardia lambia, Giardia yeah, lambia. Giardia lambia, which does terrible. Terrible things to. It does sound like an Italian football player. That's the curious. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like someone Chelsea would sign to score goals. <laughs> ever, ever score again. I can't recall there was <clears throat> one of the, um, in the sanatorium Rossia. There was uh, the the um, the what you call it, the enema became quite popular. The, the ladies there, the babushka ladies. The only help for this was to have a complete clear out and that everybody started having animus. I recall coming back from shooting one day and Brian Cox had had it and was very poorly and had been off and couldn't shoot. And I was I was going back to my room and I looked down a corridor and I saw Brian standing outside his room with a little towel around his midriff. The guys would be outside the windows with their bin bags packed, try to sell them $5, $5 for 50 pounds of the pot. <laughs> Beautiful building. When, and these guys had, had bullet wounds from Afghanistan. Almost, almost all of them. They were, yes. There were three yeah. or four of these guys all who had their bullet wounds, and they would show them to you proudly and so on. So Afghanistan was a was a bad place to be a Russian soldier. Sure. We bought lots of stuff, didn't we, from those guys? I remember buying all the jackets, and and there, the famous the famous uh, quote was uh, after we had bought everything from them, the colonel came to Muir or Malcolm and was begging him, please don't let your people buy anything else from our, our men because apparently the whole stores have been wiped out, the boots, the belts, the jackets, the bags. bags the bags, those heavy bags, those heavy thin bags. Yeah. I, bought, I got three of those from that truck through Poland. Remember, we, we shipped yeah, a whole Yeah, yeah. I got a truck. Oh, wow. Well, they all burned oh. on, on the Green River in, in Utah. Oh. Uh, on the ground. I uh, I built a fire in one of those those um, pits that they they put up in the air, and and I went down to the river to wash and clean, and that was with the family, my family, and we went down to the river, and suddenly smoke started rising in the background, so those bags bit the dust, so mass came down on them. That's history gone, dude. Yes, 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 yes. I've now, got a really interesting question for Paul, actually. Uh, it's about the flogging scene. So apparently before Harper was flogged in company, your flogging scene is the only one that really showed the brutality of discipline. Um, what was that like filming that scene? And did, did they actually like whip you at all, just lightly? Or did or was it just all fake? Well, I hope they would. Um, I've still got the marks on, the, on my back. <laughs> no, all, what I remember most about was if you look at any of the, uh, probably a lot of people have got the old Polaroids that we used to have and they used to take photographs. It was all Polaroids everywhere. Um, and I got a couple of those and, and any photograph you get of that place, I can't remember what it's called, but that hillside is everybody's always at a cocked angle. So all the photographs are quite strange. So first up when you turned up, the cannon that I was lashed to was sort of like facing down the hill. So there was that, you're kind of like on your side. <laughs> there I am. Oh, there's the Polaroid there. There's the Polaroid. Yeah. And uh, it, number one, it was like 90 degrees that day. So it's actually nice and warm and everything. And, uh, and yeah, they laid on a bit. It was like, but I remember Jim Goddard saying, oh, what, what, it was down at uh, like, sort of something like 50 lashes in the script. He said, no, bump it up, bump it up. Give him 75 or something like that. And somebody <laughs> politely said, I think it was Richard Moore, said, um, actually, it was 75. Somebody will die. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Ah, oh, sorry, just give him, make it look bigger, bigger." So yeah, it was. It, it, I was kind of lashed there for a, quite a while, but uh, no, it was a good scene. It was. I watched it last night again. It was. It was good. That location was called Olanoia. Oh, Ol Olinia. Sorry, Natasha. Olinia. Olinia. Yeah, and I remember, do you remember, because we had a lot of trouble there, because when you tried to eat your food, all the tables were on the slant, so everything slid off the tables. Do you remember? Apparently it means eagle, Alinea. That place we shot at means eagle. Oh, we're in the right place. We're in the right uh, place. I'm trying to find a picture. Uh, where was the uh, Charge of the Life Brigade? What was that? Uh, not Talavera, but there was that, a... No, it, it was in... Um, we, drove through, in the, we drove through the lane, the road to a location, went through. Yeah. The On the way to... It's near Sevastopol, and it's it's a place called Inkerman, basically, near Inkerman. That's where, that's well, where we went. And it, it, right. The costume guy on the show, whose name I can't remember, he was old. John Mollow. 
Yes, I think so. But he yeah, said to me, as we were going to head back, he said to me, come on, jump in with me. And I went in with his car. And as we drove, because I mentioned something about the battle, and he, we drove, and he stopped the driver, and we just got out and stood. And the redoubts were on either side. And we were at the top of the hill. And he said, that's what they wrote up. And I remember thinking at the time, son of a bitch. Now, that, that I love history, obviously, but it was just a wonderful moment because – those 600 ran up. A, it was a it was a sharp incline. They were riding up a hill into the guns, and the guns were on both sides. Anyway, I just remember that moment coming home. We had an interesting question coming about the horse work. I want to ask Michael this one because he's just fessed up to being terrified. Um, because they want to know: Did you have doubles for any of the horse work, or did you just have to suck it up and do it, even if you didn't really know how to ride? I had to suck it up and do it, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, I think so. Um, but I was I was helped enormously by this, this wonderful Russian stunt guy, Slava, and his then wife, who became a girlfriend Julia. later of Tom Clegg, and I've forgotten her name, but she was... She, Zulia. Was both, who? Zulia. Zulia, that's right, yes. And they both looked after me terribly well, and there's a lovely horse called Britta. And when they asked me to begin with what sort of horse I'd like, I said, I don't mind as long as it isn't too lively, preferably a dead one. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, the horse, Britta, was just beautifully managed by them both and, uh, and, and the sweetest animal I've ever sat on. Uh, Scott and her son to have a lovely story about their horses and how oh, they... Oh, God, I think you should talk, talk to... Well, nothing. It's very interesting you talk about it sort of being a public schoolboy because I, I actually got the job by pretending to be a public schoolboy. I'm from Leith in Edinburgh. So when I turned up on set, I was, I was afraid that somebody was going to go, you're not a public schoolboy. Get off of here. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that, uh, is that Michael Cochran, I did my very first professional acting job on telly with you and no job for a lady. Blow job for a lady. Good Lord. Blow job for a lady. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no job, no way to treat a lady. That was what it was called, isn't it? With, with no, Penelope it was actually Keith. no job. For, it was no job with Penelope Keith. Yeah, who, um, yeah. of all the people you could do your first job with, Michael Cochran and Penelope Keith are definitely up there with the greatest, the greatest oh. people you could ever encounter, I must admit. Oh. Penelope Keith actually fluffed our lines in the, in the scene I had to make me feel better in front of a studio audience, God love her. No. But our, our, um, I, I basically learned how to ride about a week before by running down to the Wimbledon stables and demanding that somebody teach me. Because I, I lied about being able to ride. I said, Scott, yeah. can you ride? And I went, well, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, an entirely different lifetime. You weren't uh, the only one, Scott. No, no. So, so I, I basically ran down and a 12-year-old girl screamed at me, heels down, hands up, whilst I was... Well, I learned how to write. So I basically got, got to the stage where I could get on it, sit on it, and move it without looking like a complete amateur. And then there's a, there, there was a sumter, and I'm wearing a big cape and a, and a tall top hat, and a, and a sumter's there, the only, the only woman on set. And, and what, what, I think you probably did this, Michael, as, as a sumter had a profound love for hanging out with British actors. Yes. Because there's, there's one thing that if people don't know it, the British actors, when they're on a set, the most, the best time that they have is because they're playing British actors. Mm -hmm. Is that is that we love that that whole British yeah, actor thing that like, we have going on? Okay, it's, it seriously, you it's know? an absolute delight. Um, <laughs> play, play. And and what happened was my horse, who had one eye, um, was a little frisky, and he had the hots for a sumptuous horse. So but I was. That was the first time that we met. Actually. That was the first time that we met, and I was still desperate. Is that like horse like rider? <laughs> no, 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 no. Ryder was terrified because he was because and and I was still desperately sort of trying to sort of do this half. I'm in, I'm still an English public school boy. And we had to do the scene together, so he approached me with his horse, right? Yes, and very apologetic. Apologetic. I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry. My horse, my horse is making rather rather strange noises. Um, um, excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> It was so funny. And so I, I was like, was, don't worry. I uh, know it's not you. And I it was just hi <laughs> highly amused. It was animal, animal and uh, magnetism. It just, it would just it was the animal magnetism of two horses instead of us. <laughs> yeah, that's how we started. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, look at us now, Jesus. <laughs> Twenty-seven my years later. Will, my lawyer will be calling you in the morning. <laughs> Twenty-seven years, yeah. 
You're free. Um, we actually, Assumpta, Kieran Scholl sent us two brilliant questions for you, and I really want to know the answers. The first one was, if you could have, in, have had any more scenes added for Teresa, what would it have been? Well, Apart from the one where she doesn't get killed. Yeah, well, um, he asked about that's the second part of the question is relating to that. So apart from that, well, I, I, you know, I had this 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 urge of you know of like for all the of the boys there shooting in Spain. I wanted to to bring people in Spain and see what this actually <laughs> Spain is because we were in this Russian you know environment and you know was nothing looking like Spain, and I was frustrated because you know. Um, Badajoz wasn't Badajoz at all, and so uh, even historically, so that 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 you know the location would be that, and you know I think that I would I would add more scenes I think uh, you know with Sharp actually you know understanding what was going on and if we really you know wanted to be together more and why I think that you know this this idea of always not knowing if they would go together forever, I think it would be a nice idea to understand what is was this love or respect or admiration for one another. I would add a little bit that. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> uh, the, the second part of the question was, so say she didn't die, where would the character have gone and what would she have done? Well, um, well, I think probably, you know, uh, she would, um, she would, be with Sharp, isn't it? I think that that's what, you know, we would construct a life, I think, um, you know. Antonia. Yeah, I love that, you and know. Your daughter? You had a daughter, of course. No. Antonia, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. That was in the airport. I remember that exactly that day. Uh, yes. Stansted <laughs> Airport. Stansted yes. Airport in August 15th, 14th of 1993. Yes, yes. Wow, Mir. Yes, yes. Uh, I love. We waited. We waited for about five hours for our plane. Yes, I was very nice to you know to be. A Jer- I remember that we we went to his house afterwards. No, after the no with him, yeah. Scott, uh, Jeremy. No, I never. I oh, no, no, we never. You never had. I, I never met. Talk. Never met the man. I love how to how he was speaking. <laughs> it's not British oh, darling, thing. darling, darling! <laughs> Just because I can't remember anybody's name, that's why everybody's called darling. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Of course, darling. And here's uh, your first night at work on the second series, Asunta. Oh yeah, I remember that too. I loved being there in this, uh, yeah, in this environment. I remember that. Is that, oh, yeah. Linton, is that Linton's stunt double kneeling down there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had to that put was, double on. That was Helen Hamover's son, Ilya. Remember Ilya? Uh, oh, he, wow. He helped, he helped us with the costumes. He got fetch and carry and stuff. Really, he was a little uh, kid. Uh-huh, the, uh-huh. the Russian costume lady's main uh, son. And um, a few years later, he showed up in London, very surprisingly. Oh. Uh, knocking at my door, asking for money. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, so freaky. I mean, you know. Wow. I had a wow. lot of, you know, visitations from Russia, but this one was pretty freaky. And I had to say, what, what, what do you want? What money? What, 10 quid? Do you want what, what you would expect? And it's like, he was expecting probably like a thousand quid or or something. It was very weird. But what, what, what did he wanted to do with? Oh, well, I don't know, to survive in London, to, to buy drugs, to buy a sharp box set. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not enough to buy a sharp box set. You know that, no. <laughs> especially not these days. But I think one of the things. I think one of the things with Asumta is is that you're tough as nails. You're tough as nails, and you exude that. And that's sort what's sort of perfect casting for you is is Teresa because you you are not a shrinking violet. You are you are hard as hell. But it, but, but it was really uh, well, I don't know. I didn't have any casting at all. I mean, they just called me and I went. Yeah, I know. But if you look at your previous films, I mean, no. you, you, in, in 90% of them, that. you're killing people. <laughs> you're stabbing them, you're shooting them, you're killing them. Sometimes you're having sex with them, then killing them. I mean, you're, sometimes you're having sex with them and then you kill them while you're having sex with them. I mean, it's just, uh, you know. And there are a couple, Gavin, you've got so many roles behind you other than Sharp. And a couple of people, some, a lot of people ask, what was more fun, Sharp with Sean Bean or Val Kilmer and Willow? Uh, Sharp's was unique for me. Sharp's was unique. Uh, 
Well, it was great fun. You know, I like horses. You know, even though, uh, I mean, the horses in, uh, in Sharps, uh, I got knocked off. And I was shown three days later that it was actually one of the Russian uh, horsemen in, the, in a battle scene had driven his horse into the chest of my horse. And I thought that I just fell off. So I was pretty embarrassed about that because uh, horses are swirling and turning and moving. And, but I was actually rammed. And uh, the, the, the story to that is that I was then swept across the altar to a hospital. And uh, because I landed on my wrist and arm and uh, the, I met a, they, they had a glass block entranceway. It was so poor, Russia. It was the poverty was extreme. And Ukraine, Gav. Ukraine. Ukraine. And uh, the they took me in, and there was a doctor in a, in a desk with a single light bulb, bare light bulb, in a room hanging. And we began to talk, and he was thrilled to have met an American. And we began to talk about different things, and uh, obviously Russia was changing at the moment. And he took me in to have the X-ray done. And I remember sitting there, and this X-ray, this very old X-ray machine, was like shifted over toward me. And he gave me a piece of lead that size, maybe three inches square, four inches square to cover my nuts with. <laughs> Normally, you're given something, a, a good football, right? <laughs> I'm on your nuts, right? So remember, I'm, 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 I'm holding this little tiny square over my nuts thinking, is this going to do anything? And then <laughs> looking at, the, looking at the, the date on the x-ray machine, it's Wisconsin, 1947. <laughs> so it must have been one of the first extra machines ever. So anyway, that's uh, that's that's another memory that uh, abides by me. So, but no, the the, the uh, no, I had a ball in this thing. Well, do you remember? Do you remember? Oh, Gav? I was having a rough ride, and he was. I mean, one of the interesting things with that was that uh, there's a scene where I had to uh, speak to the uh, the little guy in the cage, or valve in the cage. And Val had split the set because he was having in, in he was having a fight with Lucas over the uh, the toys that they sell and make fortunes out of, and he wanted a piece of that. And so uh, I had just been knocked over by a horse. I had a horse back on me. It rushed in. When we were shooting that film in New Zealand, the horses were pulled out of the fields in the winter, and they didn't like it. And I had to ride a gray. And the one that I had was uh, it spun back on me and came back on me and landed on me. And so I was. I had to block up my nose because it was bleeding. And, and Lucas and Ronnie said, "I know Ronnie since I started." And uh, say, Ron Howard? "Huh? Yeah, Ron Howard." Yeah, from Happy Days things. Way yeah, back. Ron Howard. Yeah, very very smart for me anyway in L.A. But anyway, uh, the I remember that we're standing there and they're they're all freaking out because there's there's no way to shoot the scene. Val's not going to come. He's pissed off. He's gone off. And Greg Powell turns to me and says, and he bends down and he says, get on my shoulders. And I'm two, maybe 215 at the time, 210. Greg's 270, 280. He picks me up, stands me up on his shoulders. And I turn and I suddenly realize what he's doing. And I turn to some, one of the guys and I said, give me a rope. Give me anything. So a guy threw me a piece of rope. And so I hung this rope from my hand as if I'm holding the reins or something. And we played the scene with Greg doing this. <laughs> <laughs> we shot the scene. And someone would throw Val's lines and we played it. And that's actually, that's actually what's in the film. So, you know, I have fun and all that kind of stuff. But, Sheriff, this was unique. You can see just, we're, we're an hour and 20 minutes in. We haven't seen each other in 35 years and we're still talking. <laughs> So, John Fairburn, this, actually, you mentioned Happy Days. Um, I have to ask you, I loved watching that when I was a kid. Um, if they'd have, John Fairburn wants to know, if they kept your character in Happy Days, do you think your career would have been different? No, no. I, I pulled out. Okay. I asked out after the first half. I didn't understand a goddamn thing about it. I didn't understand the humor. I didn't want it. They sent me to college to the university in the first show. So I was going to be, you know, paid. Uh, I was on a contract, seven year contract, 11 of every 13, and I was going to be paid. But I was going to have to sit around for three or four years before they could think of what to do with me because, you know, once, once, you know, Henry did, you know, kind of went 
hey, did that, he was going to be the focus. Yeah. Everybody knew that. And uh, they had focused on too many others. I was going to be just sent off into Siberia for three years, and I didn't want to do that. So I asked out, which pissed off the writers. But, no, I was glad to get out of it. Mm-hmm. I have no, no regrets about that one. <laughs> by, the, by the same token, Gav, Leroy is in all of the books. He gets killed in Sharp's honour, which is quite far in. So, you know, you should have been in all the Sharps, really. Yeah, that is Henry Hugh Watson. Maybe, maybe. Were you hoping to get a call to go maybe. back? Spoilers, I, Jason. I, this guy, Greg Powell, one day, because when that horse backed on me, they had to find another one. And that's the one I dove off of, which I shouldn't have. But the... Uh, there was a, I went up to the stables and Greg was, had another gray that was pissing them off because it was, they don't like it. It's winter time. They don't want to be brought in and put under some kind of, you know, weird control and stand in front of 800, you know, people, many of them little people walking by with guns and things glinting and explosions in the distance and all. Anyway, this horse was, was, was a, what he, the horse did with the horses that know what they're doing. They, they drop the head to the ground. They come up fast. Then they do it again, and they come up faster. And on the second go, they get you, and they just knock you back. They knock the shit out of you, and you go back with them. And this horse, the first one, came down on me and kind of came on and slid off. And I was big enough, and I got lucky. He didn't do any damage. But the second one, Greg was there. And this horse is giving him trouble, and Greg stepped off in front of him. And Greg's uncle uh, sparred with Joe Lewis. Greg comes from an East End, East London family. They're all fighters, all boxers. <laughs> Greg, all 280 pounds of with big fists, right? Just went whoomp right into the neck of this horse. Well, I got to tell you, this horse, it was like you hit it with an electric shock. He just went toop for about five or six seconds. Then Greg said, okay, get on him now. <laughs> and I gotta, that horse was sweet as pie from that moment on. And I thought, oh, God, this is that, that's how you do it? And Greg said, yeah. You know, so anyway, I can keep on. So that's it. Yes. No, I love this show, and I'm talking to these guys because the memories are so strong and so wonderful. And it was so crazy. And Russia back then was, was like you went into some kind of mad, you know, surreal world where there were no Ukraine. And it was unique for that. For Ukraine, that. Gav. Ukraine. Oh, whatever, Ukraine. All right, all right. But do you remember, do you remember the, the nickname we had for you? Poplito, remember? The nickname we had for um, Gav when he fell off the horse? Oh, no, I only remember horse. Yeah, horse. That was his nickname, horse. The yeah. horse. Yeah, exactly. Horse. That was yeah. your nickname, Gav. Remember, like, horse. That's more British logic for you. After you fell off and broke your wrist, you were named horse. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mm. Uh, were, you, were you ever hopeful that they'd ask you to come back and do more? Um, not really. I was working a lot back then. And, uh, it was it was it was a wonderful experience, a wonderful job with a group of wonderful people, as Cocker said earlier. It was uniquely one. There were a couple of people that I'd rather do without, but for the most part, this, <laughs> this was a this was a, a, just a wonderful experience, and uh, in a in a land where fences were tree branches jammed into the ground, and you'd drive through a village at night at dusk, and you'd see a single sky dish at the end of town with a generator fired up, and the entire village is watching Dallas. <laughs> this was unique. This yeah. was. Unique. We tried to get a sky dish in, um, put in at the Rossiya, but the the sky footprint only went as far as Yugoslavia, so we couldn't. We almost oh, yeah. had football, yeah. So instead, we made um, we um, we had ta- tapes sent out, videotapes. Yeah. Anyway, so Paul, there's just one more for you. Uh, Mar- actually, I'm going to ask Marcus. Marcus, why does Dobbs have such a cult following? You know, chosen men, but he's he's one of the more relatable. I think that also. Oh me. Sorry, do do I have a following? Yeah, yeah. Patrick yeah. Does have a cult following, <laughs> and I think with my Martin, first following, I can't believe it. No, and it's it, because everybody wants to be a chosen man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was watching it again last night, and uh, you know, at the end, yeah. he said, "You want to become a chosen man?" He says, "Oh yeah," and then he disappears. I thought, oh, "I'd love to become a chosen man," but I, you know, I'd have had to wear the green, I suppose, wouldn't I? Mm. Mm. Well, it says for a minor role, he seemed to be very present. How did that feel, especially when you were on set with, like, Michael Cochran and Daniel Craig? And is it weird looking back at everything they've gone on to do since? No, it it was, uh, uh, like everybody says, you were kind of a part of a big, it was like a big family, actually. And I think all the adversity that we, we went through in the very, very beginning 
um, it brought everybody together really quickly. It didn't matter what kind of part you had. You know, I was in it, you know, I was in it bits and pieces a little by little, you know, but he, he's there and, and it, you know, I was just watching last night and Danny Craig at one point says, oh, Dobbs is doing this, that, the other very early on. So they're alluding to him and he's always part of the story. Mm. Um, and for the South Essex, he's just sort of one of the pivotal bits there that gets, you know, it, it focuses on him and him dropping and him not, you know, it, that, that's what brought it out for the South Essex uh, amongst the ranks. Uh, but you never felt that you were you were a smaller part or whatever because everybody uh, you know that we knew as a family off screen um, we were all part of a bigger unit which was um, something that was the adversity that hit us in the first few weeks. Uh, you felt you were sort of having to sort of hunker down together to sort of get through it, and so I never felt any of that. I always felt, you know, whenever I meet anybody down the street and with anybody that I've ever met, you kind of always, first of all, you go, "Oh, we survived." You have a big hug and go, "God, what, what did that really happen?" You know what I mean? And so, um, so yeah, well, I didn't realise I had a following at all. <laughs> well, well, Sharp, Sharp says to you, "It's it's a good job if you can stay alive. It's yeah, a bit yeah. like being on Sharp." You know, it's a good job. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like... And when I watched it last night, I was like, yeah, right on, Sean, because that is exactly how we all felt. Um, no, I, I really enjoyed myself. And uh, lots of, I mean, at the time you thought you were going to die, but uh, a lot of times. I remember seeing um, Troughton come in uh, on a stretcher. He'd just come back from the hospital one day at the Rocia. And uh, I managed to catch him in the hallway, and they just were bringing him in. And I said, how was it? How was it, David? And he said, uh, you don't want to go in there. Don't get ill, mate. Don't get ill. I thought, oh, fuck, we've got to try and get home, please. Um, but, yeah, it was uh, it was strange times and really heady times, you know. What I found most interesting was being in that strange palace. There was no food. I mean, you like look at the pictures. You look at it. It's a palace. No Lavaria? food. Straight, what, what, sorry? Which palace? Lavaria Palace? No, La Rocia. Oh, right. yeah, 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 and, and you were in all this beautiful place with swimming pools and whatever, but you kind of sort of, sort of felt for your life, you know. Does anybody remember, by the way, that bird, Yashka, the raven? Yes, Yasha, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 He yeah. used to come in your room and things like that. It was a really strange sort of place to be. It was great, though. No, I really enjoyed it. I, I'm glad I got right. following that. I'm going to ask you then. I'm going to go around the room with this actually, because Harry Axenson wants to know. Would, if you were offered Napoleonic again, would you do it? Obviously, I don't think they'd get away with what happened on Sell and Sharp anymore, with health and safety being what it is. But would you all jump back in if you got the chance? Paul Bigley? Yeah, I would. I would. Because I, I tell you what was really weird. That One of the first opening shots of the South Essex was there walking along. That was one of the first things I did. Uh, being amongst that group of army people, and all the Russians, they were the conscripts, you know, they were proper army people. Uh, but I remember feeling when they were playing the, the, the drums and the, the flutes were going and all that, and you kind of felt, why would any, before that I felt, why would anybody go and do this? You know, musket balls were that big, they were an inch wide. If you got hit by anything, you were dead in, almost instantly. But I remember thinking, actually, you know, I can understand why people sort of left uh, Britain to go and fight in other places. Yeah, it, it, it suddenly became romantic, you know what I mean? You, and since I, de- I delved a little bit after that and found out that I did, like most of us, have people who were in the army quite far back, going back to the 1800s. I never knew that before, but that program prompted me to go and have a scratch around, and I found that I had relatives who had fought in India around the same period. And So it was quite strange, you know. Yeah, I would immediately, because I love... i tell you what I really love, is having the flap in the trousers that came down so that you could have a pee in the middle of nowhere. That was brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) Jason, I know you'd jump back in. Well, I did every time. Even uh, two years where I said, Jason, we can't give you any more pay. And if you don't answer now, we'll get someone else. Twice I got that said to me. Deep into the show. Three, four years into the show. But I stuck with it. Would you go back? Because you didn't go back. Would you go back now? Yeah, would you do sharp again? It's would you do yeah, sharp again? Of it's it's sort of you know I mean it's kind of one of the sort of like sort of thing you become an actor for, isn't it? You know you get a a cool outfit and as Paulie said there, you know you're with like a load of extras and it's all flapping the trousers, flapping the trousers. <laughs> And there's Greg Powell punching your horse and, uh, and you know, and somebody shouting action and, uh, it's, you know, of course. It's, 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 it's the movies, isn't it? You know, it's, it's action picture. Sort of thing that, you know, we, we 
I think we talked about this before, you know, the sort of thing we grew up with, you know, like uh, war movies and The Great Escape and all that type of type of jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus I'm saying yes because you never know, there could be a casting director for listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, because obviously you're doing something very, very different now, aren't you? A, a bit different. Um, the thing that I, the thing that comes back to me most about this, to be honest, is I guess it was that first five weeks or so before we came back and then things things got better, was the problems with the food, the problems with the water. It was almost impossible to get a phone call to London. Uh, and the, and But the, the great, um, well, and another thing that stands out very strong to me was, as Paul alluded to, I was I, I got kind of quite frightened about it because I thought I can't do this thing with this horse and the horses are out of control. It was all the things that about the stunt, um, the Russian stunt guy being in charge of the stunts and having to. Uh, Jim would have to say to the translator that would then go to the Russian stunt guy, then back to the translator, then back to Jim, and it was all taking forever. And then Mark Jenny, the first AD, it seemed to be that first battle scene we ended up kind of going, Mark saying, let's do the battle scene and we'll pick up shots all over the place and think, this is chaos, this is chaos and dangerous. And the first battle scene, as I recall it, uh, a number of stuntmen were injured. It's when Gavin, I think, broke his arm. And the next morning, we all gathered in the, the regulars' tent to discuss about how we were going to deal with what was a bit dangerous. We're a long way from home. What do we think about this? And as we were having this meeting, Jim Goddard and Mark Jenny came in, and Jim said, what's this then? Is this a mother's meeting? Do we remember this? It was the most extraordinary things I've ever seen, where I thought the director's going to come in and got all his actors there saying, well, actually, we're a bit nervous about, you know, lots of people getting hurt. It seems a bit dangerous. Um and that he would obviously say, oh, I know, it's the first scene, we had a few teething problems, don't worry, I'll look after you. And instead, Jim said, you bunch of fucking bastards, you get me out here, you think you got me over a barrel, I'll, uh, you knew it was, a, I remember he said, you knew it was an action picture, you knew people were going to get hurt. And I thought, you never said anything to me at the meeting about, you know, you might get run through with a sabre while you're at work, or you might get, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're endangering your life to come in and do this job. Quite apart from the fact you couldn't eat them. There was another thing I remember was about the, the caterer that we took with us, the chef we took with us, saying uh, he was getting all his meat from Chernobyl and that he had to, <laughs> had to put the tumors out of the meat before he could cook it. So we all discovered, I don't know whether this is actually the Russian word for it, but I remember we all started saying vegetarianski when the nice ladies in the restaurant downstairs, the nice lady, the dinner ladies had come out with their trolleys with cabbage, mashed potato, and a lump of something brown covered in some sort of brown gravy-like sauce. And or you would say, to, they'd come along and put the plate in front of you, and you'd say, oh, vegetarianski. And they kind of shrug, and they take put the plate back on the trolley, take it back in the kitchen, come back five seconds later with the mashed potato and the cabbage and a sort of brown smear where they just swept the, the meat off the plate. And that was your vegetarian option was... You have you just have the cabbage and potatoes without the meat. I think that's part of the reason we all. I lost about. I wasn't the figure of a man I am now, but then in the first five weeks, I lost about a stone and a half. I think because I was living on, uh, partly again due to the the help of Michael Cochran, I was living almost solely on cigarettes and whiskey because you used to be able to get the famous grouse at the hard dollar shop at the hotel in Yalta, didn't you? Um, so my my. But from all, and then having to buy, then we all bought our own cookers and doing our own shopping and blah, 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 and all that sort of, Gavin doing the marvellous cooking and things. But the abiding thing to me, really, is being a long way from home, out of touch, frightened, blah, blah. But the the group of people I was there with were the most wonderful, um, as people have said, kind of like a family who I thought sort of rescued me um, and saved me through this thing that went seemed to go on and on and on and on. And that out of out of quite, quite a difficult beginning, we, we ended up having a, a rather marvellous time, I thought. But that was because of the, the, sort of the fortitude and the support of lots of marvellous people. And, and that is what I remember most about it nearly 30 years later, was lots of disastrous things, but lots of laughter and support and kind of mm -hmm. partying through the dark times kind of thing. You know? Neil, this, the, the meeting you said didn't take place in a tent. It took place outside the makeup tent, and that's a picture of that meeting. Ah, no, that's not the meeting I'm referring I think that the meeting... This is I one where you, you, came, you, you told Paul, Paul, we can't go on with this. We've got to stop. We've got to stop. And I think Dara is in the picture somewhere there, and this was a, a meeting outside a tent where you all said, look, 
we, we've got to do something about I it. Th- my memory of it is that the night after the, after the first part of the first battle scene where Gavin broke his arm, we were all a bit concerned about it. And that night in the, the goat and balalaika, we were talking about, uh, you know, what we're going to do. This is a bit worrying. We already just started this thing. There's like loads more battles, scenes, horses and stuff. What we're going to, we, and my memory of it is that we decided then that us guest ones would come from our tent to your regulars tent and we would have a meeting the next day to, to kind of decide who's going to go and speak to Muir or Malcolm or somebody about, you know, we, we have concerns. What are you going to, how's this going to work out? And that we, we were my my memory of that meeting is that we were inside your tent for that meeting, and then in came uh, Jim and Mark. This obviously looks like another well, obviously another group of people listening to Brian. This was so, definitely a meeting about something to do with like we've got yeah, to yeah. stop. So well, I, think I, 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 rem- I do remember it. I, I remember it like that, Neil. And it's the first time I've remembered it since you said it there. That, that I remember sitting in that tent in the dim light and everything, and then and then. Uh, Jim and uh, Mark Jenny just coming in very quietly and then him saying that, which is why for me it was strange because I know that I learned a lot later on about certain parts of the politics that had happened behind the scenes that I didn't know about. Mm. Uh, and so when there was a moment where I was kicked off set because uh, we were on the top of a mountain somewhere mm. filming, I can't remember, and there was a big setup and things were coming to a head in the first part of it and um Jim had been shouting at Ivan Strasberg to to move yeah. these really heavy cameras up and down, and I said, "He said, God, you no, know, you know." And everybody had been out on the lash the night before, and uh, so you know, probably a few people were sort of hung over. But uh, Ivan was doing his job and sort of carrying this camera around. I remember thinking, "Bloody hell, leave him alone!" Uh, and uh, and everybody was a bit, bit tense. And eventually, uh, he shouted at Nolan, saying, "Nolan, where you know was Nolan?" And Nolan said, "I'm here to so, get in the shots." And then he said, and I was standing right behind Jim, and I got on with Jim, you know, and Jim said, Dobbs, where's Dobbs? And I said, I'm here, Jim. And he said, uh, right, get in the fucking shot. And I said, oh, 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 for God's sake. And he said, get in the shot and shut up. I said, no, you shut up. <laughs> and he said, right, get off my set. And I thought, oh, come on. At one point, I thought, well, I've got a brown vest and he's got a shooting stick, so who's going to come out better? Um, <laughs> I really thought that. I thought, you know, it's going to come to it. We're going to have a fight. But that was the moment he said, and, and the third came to me and said, he's, he really wants you to get off. You're going to have to leave the shot. You're going to be out of the scene and you're probably going to go home. So we went. I went down the mountain in this truck thinking, that's it. It's finished for me. I'm over. I'm out of here. But I wasn't particularly perturbed because I thought, poor buggers, everybody's going to stay in that maelstrom. But uh, he did come up to me later. There was an organized meeting later at, uh, outside one of the balconies and the thing, and uh, he wanted me to apologize. And I said, look, Jim, you know, my problem with it was that he was having a go at Ivan, uh, and Ivan and all the crew were lugging all this stuff around. I just, I thought it got to a point where you thought this can't go on, you know. And mm. but the politics that I learnt later was that I don't think he wanted it to go on either. That's what I felt, um, and uh, and that's why it all came to a head around Paul McGann's leg. And but at the time it was uh, it was getting quite hairy between a few people, you know. And I thought Jim. You know, it's kind of turned on us a little bit, you know, uh, at some point. But, yeah, that's my feeling. <laughs> Alex, yeah, I remember that now. You, you have it. Michael, inter- yeah. But um, if the group of people were the people who I work with, without a doubt, they were the finest people I've ever come across. I've never forgotten any of them, with Bless you, a few, very few exceptions. Jason, uh, I, we haven't mentioned it enough, Um Selkie Bingo is going to have been pretty dull for people today. Are you writing a book? Yes, I am writing my memoir. It's called From Crimea with Love, and it's published by Unbound, and you can pre-order it now. Brilliant. Where do you go to pre-order it? Uh, to the Unbound website, or, of course, you can always come to me. I'm easily findable, Googleable, or on Facebook. You can always find me. Lots of people do. Marcus and I are really looking forward to the launch party. Looking forward to that. Pre-ordered my book. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you have. Thank you for your support. No, you're welcome. And thank you, History Hack, for opening up this portal on the world of Sharp. Really brilliant, Alex. You, you, I really appreciate what you've done, yeah? Oh, and Marcus, too. We have great fun every time. Thank you very much. You too, you all. It was very nice to see you. And Paul Trussell, big, big hack for you, too. And thank you as well. Asunta, Asunta and Scott, we're going to be doing Sharp's Company in October, yeah? So that will be our next one, okay? Try and keep me away. 
<laughs> do I have to still pretend? Do I have to still pretend I'm an English public school boy? Or can I come yeah, in? Yeah, you can. I'm Scottish now. Just for my amusement, yeah. Yeah. Lots well, of love to you. We'll see you all. We'll see you all in, in, uh, in soon. Thank you, Mr. Cochran, for being a wonderful first experience of, as a professional actor. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, no, 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 no. These are things that are really important. These are things that are really, really important. Oh, well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a sweet thing to say. No, oh, yeah. it's it's one of the things. I mean, we 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 teach. We've taught for twenty years, and one of the first things that we tell each other, you know, when we tell our students is, just be a nice guy, <laughs> just be a mensch. You know, it's it doesn't cost much, and trust you me, they'll be talking about you in thirty years time. <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can, I can tell you what I can bookend that l- l- story of Cocky because I worked with you, Michael, on uh, Wexford afterwards with Jim Goddard, and I had one scene. I had about eight lines in it. I was playing a market stall holder. There was very little said about this character. We didn't really know much about him, so I went for the costume fitting, and I said, "Look, why don't we just for a laugh just make this guy like a goth." You know, just so it's a bit more interesting. They were like, yeah, great, great idea. So they gothed me up. And off we went. And did we film it down? I think it was down in Southampton. Yes. Yeah. We were down there in a hotel. We were down in a... I was in a hotel for one night. Next morning, first up, my scene, I was in a hotel for the night with Michael Cochran, right? This is a quite a bad recipe for disaster. So we <laughs> started... <laughs> We started, we had a bit, a bit of food. There was about three or four of us. I can't remember who else was there, Mike, but maybe you can. But anyway, we ended up, obviously, in your room and drinking. Do you remember this? No, I did. It got to about midnight. I was like, look, you know, I've got, I'm getting picked up at six. I, I probably ought to go. And you're like, no, no, have another drink, darling, and all this. <laughs> So I had a few more drinks and then it got to about two in the morning and I was like, guys, like, and I was pissed as a fart, you know, (laughs) really, I've, I've got to, I've got to go, you know, I mean, I've I've got this scene for, he's like, have one more drink, blah, blah, blah. It got to about five in the morning (laughs) and and Cochrane says to me, well, literally, there's no point in you going to bed now (laughs) (laughs) and you'll be fine. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, oh, and I, I never did this sort of thing, you know. So I did. I, I, I got. I went back to my room, just quickly showered, put my clothes, changed the clothes, and then, and then they picked me up. I had no sleep. I was still utterly pissed as a fart. And they picked me up and they took me off to the set, and I was like, sweating booze, absolutely <laughs> great, shaking like a leaf, right? <laughs> and uh, so I get in my goth gear and I'm looking in the mirror, I just look like a wreck and I think, fucking hell, I'm going to fa- have to face Jim Goddard, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and do this thing, uh, looking like a, a corpse. And uh, so anyway, so I went to the set and I was sat there waiting. Eventually Jim came in and he hadn't seen me in my golf gear and he looked me up and down and he went, yeah, yeah, looks, uh, looks all right, actually. Looks like you haven't been to bed all night. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how I, 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 amazingly, in a way you were right, there was no point in it. And I played the character. <laughs> this massive hangover and it was it was actually okay sort of thing but you were very naughty weren't you well, I apologize <laughs> <laughs> he said that but he doesn't no. really look remotely sorry no I don't Michael know. Cochran leading I, actors I, astray I, since 1980 yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it yeah I feel like t-shirts need to be made I've drunk <laughs> with cocky yeah and Good. lots of love to you all it's wonderful seeing you and laughing with you again. And um, thank you very much for everything. Thank Lovely you. See you, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's great. Can We've I just good... say, it's now my life's ambition to go drinking with Cocky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a dangerous occupation. I know. I feel like I want to live on it. Marcus, what do you reckon? I, I think we've got to arrange that. That sounds like well, a, a challenge we're trying, of, aren't of, we, to of last Napoleonicist, like standing against Cochrane. Lovely to see you all. Yeah, Lovely. beautiful. Thank you so much, you guys. And Great take good. care, right? Oh, look, Thank you to everyone. everyone. Thank you. And reminisce. Neil, brilliant you came on. For too long. See you later. Thank you. See you later, man. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.
Brilliant. All right, Jace. Listen, I'll speak to you soon, Jason. Yeah, definitely. Bye, all. Yeah. I'll send you a link to this. Okay, great. Enjoy Thank the... you, guys. See you, Thank Gav. You. Bye. Good to see you all again. All right, Jason, I'm head now. Gav, yeah, thank you for joining. See you, Jace. See you later, Paul. See you, Gav. Bye, yeah. guys. See you. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe. Don't forget, you can become a patron of History Hack for as little as a dollar a month. Just go to www.historyhack.podbean.com. It will help us keep going in the aftermath of the coronavirus, and we would really appreciate it, as we would love to do so.